train to the spot where you don't make a mistake because your body won't let you make a mistake. You know, I mean, whatever you do, whether it's baseball, basketball, football, roping, whatever it is, I've come to realize it is consistency. If I don't go rope that dummy, you know, a hundred times every other day, well, then I go to a rodeo and I run across the line and stick it around one of them's eyes, you know, it's like, why'd I do that, you know? Right. And well, it's because you hadn't been practicing. Just do the basic things and that extra stuff will come because of you can do the basics to an elite level. In the performance horse world, people who compete at an elite level don't usually climb to the top quickly. Like most achievements in life, it takes years of dedication, a strong work ethic, and the right mindset to stick with the process and grind it out. As a former college athlete, I know this to be true, and I'd add that through it all, you have to genuinely love what you're doing. My passion for horses and my competitive nature makes me hungry for answers. So I've set out to discover the psychology behind success stories living the Western lifestyle, to expand my awareness and apply what I've learned in my own life. This journey of discovery will be uncomfortable for me, but the reward will be unmeasurable. I'm Mike Roberts, and this is The Converse Cowboy. Presented by Kerry Kelly Bits and Spurs and Schaefer Outfitter. On this episode of the Converse Cowboy, we continue the tour going from Glen Rose to Alito, Texas to sit down with Buster Frierson. Buster is well known for his success in the ranch rodeo scene and has also created quite a large following on Instagram, exposing the world to the Western lifestyle and what cowboying is like in 2020. I look forward to sitting down with Buster to understand the how and why behind what he does. I wish we could have had the cameras going last night and then yeah. today, you know, but uh, it's, that's all it's going to be. It's just another conversation. But I want to dive into Buster Frierson's life. I want to talk about a day in the life and really get get your story, not only for myself, because I am scratching my own itch with this show. So I have questions, but also hopefully some viewers and listeners will be able to get some stuff from this as well. So, um, so you're out here. We're in close to Fort Worth. I mean... This is a very unique place where you're at. So, six thousand. How many acres? 4, there's four thousand acres four, here. So yeah, there's four thousand acres. acres we're, we're maybe twenty minutes from yeah. Fort Worth. Hell, I can see the skyline from yeah, here. Yeah, twenty twenty five minutes from downtown Fort Worth. So, I think I saw on your Instagram your urban ranching. Yes, sir. And so, can you talk a little bit about that and what you know what that's like for you? Uh, you know, I mean, it's a it's a really cool. We kind of visited about it this morning a little bit, but it's uh, you know, I, in twenty five minutes I can even less time than that I can be and get anything that I need you know or want or you're right here in the edge of Fort Worth so it's easy it's accessible you can jump on I-20 and you can be anywhere around Fort Worth that you need to be in 20 or 25 minutes but you also when you drive across the cattle guard you're on a old-fashioned kind of working ranch you know and I've kind of kept it that way I've been here 16 years and uh, you know do everything horseback and kind of old school I guess as you put it and uh, you know so it's it's very unique situation like I say you can see downtown Fort Worth you can see the buildings from here from the front porch but yet you can look south and you don't see anything you know it's just pasture rolling prairie so it's a it's a very unique situation it's been cool to be here and you know been blessed to be where I'm at so yeah you do a very good job of of just that of staying with the traditions of the old school but also blending the new school and and we'll get into some of the stuff that you have going on right now but um it's very cool to to see that and you know with the social media stuff to be able to expose some of those old traditions that the folks are interested in that that may not be able to see or they may live in the city and not have exposure to it you know so that's that's life on the ranch but you're also doing some some competition stuff with the ranch rodeos i've always kind of ranch rodeo you know for the last 20 something years of when the ranch rodeo Rodeos kind of started, well, got big, I would say. I mean, they've been around, I think Wichita Falls might have been the first really big ranch rodeo, you know, back in 85 or 6, maybe something like that. Maybe a little older. It might be a little older than that. But, you know, the ranch rodeo kind of took off of 95, 97, 98. And I've kind of been doing the ranch rodeo just because that's, I, I like competition no matter what it is. And that was kind of what I did. And so... I've been in that scene for a pretty good while, and I'm a member of the WRCA, which is the Working Ranch Cowboys Association, and uh, 
we go to quite a few little jackpots. We go to Denver to the National Western Stock Show, and it's an invite-only rodeo, but we get to go up there and uh, go to Houston to that rodeo and go to San Antonio to that ranch rodeo, you know, and so those bigger, bigger productions have now implemented a ranch rodeo because it is a fan favorite. It's something that people really like to watch, and it kind of goes back to the old traditional roots of modern-day rodeo is how actually, you know, what it... It transformed what we do on an everyday basis into a specialized event, you know, and so that's what you see at the PRCA and the open rodeos. And uh, But now they're kind of implementing ranch rodeos back into it, and it's a fan favorite, you know. I mean, you get to see guys in a team atmosphere that do events that relate back to the everyday working class of ranch cowboy. Yeah. And, uh, so it's cool. You get to see some good horses. You can show enough some cowboys that don't get to town much. You know, they get to come to town and showcase their skills and kind of what they do on a daily basis. And it kind of brings to the forefront that there are still guys out there that are old school, traditional cowboys that punch cows, work on a ranch, you know, every day that you don't you, you don't necessarily see them all the time. But when you do get to see them, it's pretty impressive in what they get to do. And I get to be a part of that in which, you know, it's. I'm, I'm honored and privileged to get to be a part of it, you know, and I've kind of, over the years, I've kind of, you know, I'm, everybody knows that I ran rodeo. I'm not saying that I'm not by any means. There's way better guys at Cowboy than me, and there's way, they're way better at ranch rodeo than me, but I've done it long enough now that I've just kind of stayed in everybody's face for so long that they, you know, they associate me. Oh, you're ranch, you know, you ranch rodeo, you know, and so that, that makes me feel good that I get associated with it and kind of, have a name for that, I guess, you know, and so I've been to the WRCA World Finals, I think like seven or eight times and I've won top horse at the World Finals one time and won reserve top hand up there a couple times and, you know, been second place reserve world champions one year. And so, you know, I mean, I've kind of got a reputation about doing the ranch rodeos and now I'm kind of getting older and slowing down and letting those better hands that are younger kind of I just kind of follow along and take their ropes off, and I'm kind of <laughs> the se- I'm kind of the secretary, so I enter the rodeos and yeah. tell them when to be there, what to do, and and then I just get out of the way. So yeah. that uh, it's been fun, and you know I hope I can I hope I can rodeo until I'm old and yeah really crippled. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, so I'm looking at this wall of buckles over here, and the buckle you're wearing now, you know, came from Ranch Rodeo, and, and so. You said you're competitive, and uh, I'm just curious as to the mindset, you know, before you guys ride in the pen or, 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 you know, coming up with a game plan or maybe in practice, what is that mindset like going into that competition? You know, it's a, I guess in the last 15 or 20 years that Ranch Rodeo has become very competitive. I mean, like it is a, you, you have got to, if you're going to win and you're going to compete with the guys that are competing nowadays, you better sure enough have a game plan riding in there, and you better be able you you better be riding a good horse, and you better be able to compete. I mean, rope and do your deal, because it is very very competitive. And you know, it's always they say the luck of the draw. Well, it's always the draw. I wouldn't say whether it's lucky or unlucky. It's how you use that draw to your advantage, and you put a good group of guys around, you know, together, and you draw. If you draw a good animal, then you, you use that animal. And if you don't use that animal to the best of your ability, then you're going to get beat. I mean, mm. that's just the way it is. So the mindset, like on my team, is nobody's going to show out. Nobody's going to get to do everything. We're going to put the best guy in the best situation to do the best job. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I mean, you might have a guy that rides Bronx really well. Well, he's going to ride the Bronx, but he might not go in the cow milking because he's a little guy and he's not going to help you. And nobody has an ego, you know, and so I try to put a group of guys together that don't have egos, Mm -hmm. that I'm happy not ever picking my rope up because I've got guys around me that rope better than me. Or I'm happy not riding the Bronx because I got guys, I got three guys on my team this year that they're all three way better Bronx riders than I ever was. There's three guys on the team that are way better ropers than I am, you know, and so... I, I don't, you know, nowadays, I mean, I mug the cow, I'm a big stout guy, and I know that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna mug the cow, and I'm gonna mug in the double mugging if they have that, and if they have a stray gathering, I'm gonna go in the stray gathering, you know? And so I flank the calves into Brandon because we can neck them, and I can, you know, I can flank one pretty easy. So we put it, our mindset is to go in with the best foot forward, whether it's 
you know, whoever's doing what. Nobody has an ego, and it's a consistency. I mean, yeah, you might win one event, but as long as you're second or third in every event, you're going to come out on top. Mm -hmm. You know, let's not get them no time. But if we do slip up and something beats us across the line or we guy gets bucked off in a bronc ride and, you know, something freaky happens, then be consistent straight across the board. And generally that'll overcome those guys that come in there and win one event and then they're seventh, eighth, ninth place in every other event. You know, they yeah. got one guy that's really good at roping, but they got three guys that aren't that good. And so, you know, it, it all evens out in the end. And if you can put a group of guys together, and what I try to do is put a group of guys together where it doesn't matter if this guy misses, A misses, B misses, because C can rope just as good. Yeah. And so you're not losing any time. If something happens and he runs across there and he sticks it around his ears and doesn't get him caught, well, two swings down the pin, the next guy's got him roped. And, yeah. you know, if you need a mug of cow, everybody can do everything. And that's kind of the team I want to put together, you know, it's like, because mm -hmm. if I'm not there, something happens, you know, get a bronc rider that gets hurt, you get hurt in the cow milk and, you know, everybody just takes everybody's place and you're not dependent on one or two guys. Everybody can do everything. That's yeah. kind of our mindset. Yeah. And that's a long answer. <laughs> no, that's great. But, but I think I think a lot of that applies to everyday life, and that you know that's really the point of the show is to take the performance world and the and the and just real life experience and right. blend them together. And so you mentioned consistency. You bet. Same thing with anything in life that we do. You know, whether you start out at something new, it may be frustrating. And and you look at New Year's resolutions. People come out in January, and I talked about this yesterday. Um, you come out, everybody's gung ho in January. Right. In February, it kind of fades, and right. in March, it kind of fades a little more. And then by April, hell, what was my New Year's resolution? Yeah, exactly. So consistency, and it's very simple. And things I talk about in concept are simple, but they're not easy to do. They're not easy to apply. You know. You bet. Um, so I don't mean to oversimplify this, but really, it is. It is. It's the process, and trust in the process, and staying consistent right. with the daily work to 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 do these things. But on that note you know, routines, habits, um, things that you have done within the last five years that have made a positive impact on your life? So I, I guess my main deal is, and that's another thing that I'm kind of known for is I work out. I work out five, six days a week. I try to stay in shape. I try to stay in the best shape I can stay in as old as I am to be competitive with the young guys, you know, and I, and I know it's the guys are so talented nowadays in the you know, your age comes about and you start feeling the creaks and the breaks and, the you know, all the injuries that you've had over the years. And so what I try to do to stay competitive and stay consistent is try to stay in the best shape I can stay in. And so if that takes me working out five, six days a week, that's what I do. You know, I, I still rope the dummy every three or four days, you know. My dad, when I was growing up, would make me rope the dummy a hundred times straight in a row, and if I missed the number 99, I had to start over. And so I still, I implement that in my life, you know. It's just consistency, consistency. It's muscle memory. It's just doing those things correct and not developing bad habits. And there's times you develop bad habits because you're, you're injured or you're hurt or, you, you know, something happens where you can't perform to the utmost ability that you yeah. that you are used to. And so you do develop bad habits. And so I always try to train whatever it is and train out the bad habits. Mm. Train to the spot where you don't make those, you don't make a mistake because your body won't let you make a mistake. You know I mean? Whatever you do, whether it's baseball, basketball, football, roping, rodeo, whatever it is, I've come to realize in grow, you know, growing older that it is consistency. If I don't go rope that dummy, you know, a hundred times every other day, then, you know, I'm like, ah, oh, well, I don't need to rope the dummy. I can caught it 115 times in a row, you know, today, and I don't rope it for six weeks. Well, then I go to a rodeo and I run across the line and stick it around one of them's eyes, you know, it's like, why'd I do that, you know? Right. And well, it's because you hadn't been practicing. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of guys, the older they get, they get a little better in their profession or what they do in their hobbies. And so they kind of quit that practice, the basics. Mm -hmm. And it always goes back to the basics, whether it's training a horse, whether it's training a, a, a person in football, basketball. You know, the coach always told me when I was playing football, just perform the basics. Everything else will follow after that. Right. And so it's that way I implement that in my life. You know, just do the basic things and that extra stuff will come 
because of you can do the basics to an elite level. That's right. And, and yeah, I mean, so physically muscle memory, but also what that's doing is mentally, right. it's mentally. creating confidence. You bet. You know, you put in the time, you know, you woke up earlier, you, you bet. put in you the know, time at the gym. That self-discipline, you know, I mean, it, yeah. that, you know, when it's 115 degrees and it's 40% humidity around here, you know, at 530, you get off, kind of get done doing your chores and doing your work. And I pick up a rope and go out there and rope the dummy until I'm sweated through my shirt, Yeah, you know, and hanging up my son's like why you, you why you wrote that i'm like because just like you you need to practice i need to practice i still you try to you need to stay sharp and it's just self-discipline whether it's getting up in the morning and meditating and that's another thing that i've done in the last five years is i get up in the morning and meditate for 30 minutes and that kind of sounds goofy in the cowboy world and it did to me but i got to listen to a self-discipline book and you know just the little things make your bed in the morning get up in the morning and make your bed get up in the morning and meditate get up in the morning and learn how to breathe and you know i do some jujitsu and i do some boxing and do some stuff like that that i've implemented into my life mm. that have helped me better my life you know, make me feel better physically, mentally, emotionally, everything that comes along with that, you know, and it's like, oh, hell, what does meditation do? Well, I mean, you you slow everything down and you figure out how to breathe and you go back to the basics where it's just everything's clear, everything's calm, you're learning how to breathe. And when you get in a stressful situation, it's just automatic. The foundations there. Yeah, it's very cool to hear you say that. I, ne I, I, I never, or not want to say never, but you're right. In the cowboy world, that's not normal, no, right? Normal, normal, whatever that is. So I do the same thing. Like I meditate, yeah. making your bed. Morning routine is very important yeah. to me because that's easy. And I don't, I don't like four seasons make my bed. No, you know no, what I mean. Same I, it's pull just the blankets a simple, up, put the pillows. Simple, a yeah, simple just, task. It's very right. achievable. Boom, I've done that. Right on. You know, and then I go on to coffee. But meditation, yes, people are like, yeah, why meditate? Well, my goal is not to become the best meditator that I can right. be, but the goal is to have peace of mind. Now I'm, I'm consciously thinking. I'm not going through life on autopilot right. based on how I was socially conditioned to live my life as a child, you know, yeah. because really if you want to get down to it, the majority of people, and, and, and even today, like w the way we react to things is based off of something we had that was imprinted on us as children. You bet. And so, yes, focusing on the breath. You know, if you're in traffic, you see these people getting crazy, flipping right. you off, you know, it's like, all right, whatever. <laughs> you know, and then I go back to my day, but it's like before I may would have reacted to you that. Bet. And so I read a lot of Stoic philosophy and Stoicism 101 is control what you can control, you know, and it's yeah. like, can I control it? No, I don't worry about it. There you go. You know, and, and just being able to be conscious, be aware enough to recognize that. You bet. And that takes, you know, in the mind, and that takes some experience. It right. takes some mental fortitude to, instead of just reacting to a situation, to think about what the situation is and lose your emotion to that situation to actually think about what's fixing to go on. That's it. And, you know, I was, I, I'd follow Jocko Willick, you know, and this morning I was, his main deal was they were talking about police brutality and the chokeholds and all that. And it's all about training. And that's what, you know, I agree with him 100% on that. It's all about training. It's all about being put in those stressful situations over and over and over and over, a controlled environment that you can control it and you can figure out how you are going to react in that situation mm -hmm. and what you need to do to take the emotion away from it. That's it. People react to, and in my opinion too, people react to emotion, not necessarily the situation. Mm -hmm. Whether it's training a horse, whether a cow runs off, whether a horse flips over on you and you got to help somebody, you know, dig somebody out from underneath the horse, which we had two the other day at a ranch rodeo, you know, a horse flipped over on my bronc rider mm -hmm. and knocked him out and then spun him up under him and was kicking him in the face when he was knocked out. Not saying that I reacted better than anybody else, but I got to him and got him out while everybody else was scattered. Yeah, you didn't know what to do, you know. And I took a beating out of it, you know, but it was like, at that time, I didn't even realize that I had taken that beating to get him out of there, but it was that spot where I had to get my man out of there because uh -huh. he was in a spot that didn't, didn't need to be. And so, you know, I assessed the situation, went in and 
took my licks and got him out. Mm-hmm. And I was, I had to run across the arena. There was five people there before I got there, you know? And so it was that deal where it's like, now whether my meditation or whether, you know, anything of that helped me out, I, you know, I think about it. At the time, you don't think about it, whether that's, you know, I controlled everything and we got in and got him out and got everything done. And yeah, it's like, well, did that help or did that not help? You know, would I acted like everybody else or was there a reason that, I got him and nobody else did, you know. I mean, so you think about that stuff after the fact. Yeah. And it's like, hmm, maybe it does help. You yeah. Know? Maybe it doesn't, but maybe it does. Whether it does or doesn't, you know, like, you know your mindset. You know what I mean? Like, you know if you, you were bet. calm throughout that whole thing. Right. If you were panicking, whether you're reacting out of emotion, you right. know, or just reacting to the situation. Exactly. Um, do you ever read any Eckhart Tolle? Have you heard of no, that? No, sir. He wrote The Power of Now, another book called A New Earth. Um, I'm gonna send it to you though. I think you'd like it. Like it's one of those. This dude's deep, deep, deep. Like you read a paragraph and you're just like, "What the fuck?" You know. Um, but it's really good. And he talks. About, I'll just give a brief example. He talks about a lady at the airport, and the, you know her flight was canceled due to whatever, and she's flipping out. And she's cussing at the the lady there, and 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 there's everything's out of her control. And he's right. like, the only reality, the only reality is that she's standing there and she's breathing. Right. Everything else is made up in her head, exactly. you know? And so that is reality, is the perception in which right. we view the world. No doubt. You know, and so that's why I go back to the meditation. I think it's important just to become aware of all of those things, for you sure. know? And so for anybody that may be, they say, and I did, hell, I was one of them. I can't meditate. I can't meditate. Well, anybody that's saying that, and I can say this because I was one of them, anybody that says that needs to meditate more than anybody no else. Doubt. Because yes, the thoughts are gonna come through. You close your eyes, you sit down, and you're, you got music on or whatever, thoughts are gonna come. The goal is not to stop the thoughts. The goal is to recognize the thoughts. Okay, is it, a, is it um, an emotion? Or is it just a thought? Okay. Is it right. useful or not useful? Recognize it and you dismiss it. Right. You know, you just dismiss it. I listen to Headspace is a good app. I know there's a number of other good apps, but I started with five minutes. Yep. So if anybody's out there and, and wants to start meditating, I say download an app. I, I, I say Headspace and start with five minutes. Right. Do that consistently and then yep. do 10 minutes and then 20. And then pretty soon you'll be 30 or an hour. I do 45 minutes to an hour now. Right. And it goes like that, yeah. you know? And I was the same way. I started, I think I started with seven minutes. Mm-hmm. And I set my phone, my timer on my phone, and, did, and it felt like it took forever. Yeah, I can't tell how many times I, I would like, it's Pat, like my timer didn't go off. Yeah. Shit, I'm only two minutes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? yeah, so, and, and now I'm like you, I'm up to about 40 minutes. And it does, it kind of, you look up and it's like, oh, it's go- your alarm's going off, your timer's going off, and it's like, yeah. man, it, is that really oh man it has been 40 minutes you know yeah. and uh, i don't know it's one of those deals where you feel better about yourself because you did something and you accomplished it yeah. every you day you better. start off with an accomplishment yeah and uh, you know so it's a it, it, it's a feel good it's a men- mental feel good like all right i've got this accomplished today kind of like making your bed you know yeah. you got something accomplished it was a simple task it's a simple task those little tasks all the way through the day that create a success, in my opinion. That's right. So. And and another good one is Dr. Joe Dispenza. Yeah. If you ever no. heard of him, but he, um, so that that is a whole another not a whole another deal, but he goes real in, in really into depth with you know the law of attraction. He's got data behind it that shows our brain is essentially plastic, neuroplasticity, and we can rewire the networks in our brain to live the life that you really want to live. So right. you can create the life that you want to live. I know that sounds very woo-woo, and most of the folks in the cowboy world may frown upon or may not get it, and that's fine. Right, right. But it's very real. I've seen it in my life, and... Uh, Again, I'll send you that book. I like I love to gift books that, well, thank that you. I've read. I yeah, it. yeah, yeah. I'll send it to you. Um, so with that, you know, now that we've got the world figured out, um, <laughs> there is shit that comes up that we can't control. You know, those challenges or perceived failures that that come up that are out of, of our control. But what we can control is how we react to them. So I'm curious to know in your life, what is something that may be a perceived failure that sets you up for success later down the road? Ooh, uh, you know, probably, and a lot of people know this, and we kind of went over it last night, you know, it's probably when I quit drinking, 
when you know when I was I, I, I've been sober for 17 years now and it's a uh, it is something that was you know I don't, I, it was a it was a failure of mine when I was drinking that I drank too much and I don't have anything against drinking by any means I, I mean it, it some people handle it very well some people don't handle it very well I was one of those that didn't handle it very well and uh, you know so it was a it took me a period of time to figure out in a period, a, a set of situations, you know, that I, like we talked about last night, I got in trouble, got in trouble, and was always in some sort of conundrum because of my drinking. And uh, once I figured out that and was accountable, f that it wasn't anybody else's fault, that it was my doing, my creating all the problems, once I figured that out and quit that, and told myself I was gonna quit that, it changed my life. I mean, like completely 180 degree, like here we go, let's do something else. Mm -hmm. You know, let's put this effort into something that's good. And, you know, then when I started doing that, I started riding my horses better. I started cowboying a little more. I started figuring out how to do things without being foggy. Right. And, uh, you know, my life changed for the better for, you know, for me and for everybody in, that was involved in my life, you know? And so it was one of those deals that was like, aha moment, like, wow, this is, I can do this and I can actually do this better without drinking, you know? And so that was probably one, that was probably a problem that turned into a good thing about my life, you know? And, and, and I'm one of those guys where, when I decide to do something, I'm going to go 120% all in. Let's do it. And let's see how far we can take it, mm -hmm. whether it's good or whether it's bad. Yeah. I mean, if you choose the wrong side of it, well, then it takes, you know, I still put that effort in there and that 120% bad or 120% good. Well, it's just like, how the hell you want to live your life? You know, I mean, you want to have problems your whole life or do you want to just go ahead and you're still gonna have problems, no doubt about it, but they're not the same situational problems as you have, you know, just on an everyday life. So yeah, that's probably one of my biggest things that once I became accountable for myself and my actions and I was honest with myself and figured out that I caused everything, that it wasn't your fault, it wasn't the cop's fault, it wasn't the lady's fault, it well, you know, it, it was my fault. You know, it changed my life. and you know, it probably saved my life to be real honest with you. Yeah. And so that was kind of one of my aha moments where I opened my eyes and saw a little further than just through the windshield. I could see over the hill, you know, and like, man, I better get this shit together. Or I'm not going to get over the hill. Yeah. And uh, so it, that, that's cool that, that you were able to recognize that, you know, a lot of times when we're going through these challenges or failures, you, a lot of folks would just be like, poor piddle for me or right. why me or you bet. all these things. And I mean, I'm no different. I have challenges every day, you know, but it's like the thing that I found that works for me is, OK, wait a minute. Why am I? What's going on? Can I control it? Yes. Um, where's the gratitude? Right. Where can I find the gratitude? Where's the good in this? Because I may not see it right now. Like right. I may not understand why I have to go through this. Um, I'll, I'll use myself as an example. You know, I was married for five years, got separated, and uh, you know, thought I had it all figured out. Had the money, had the pretty wife, and they had she, her family had a business, and and uh, I was attached to that idea of right. a perfect life. You know, so once. Um, it took years. I'm not saying this was an overnight thing, you know. I went on a deep soul searching journey, right. um, but it's like that's what I figured out after really looking inward and and, and figuring this thing out. The challenges are going to come. You can't help it. They're going to come. And uh, but where's the gratitude, you know? And that's one thing I try to do. I'm not perfect at it, but anything that comes up, I'm like, okay. I had a blowout on the way to a horse show two weeks ago. And I'm smiling about it. <laughs> I'm like, most people will be pissed off and cussing. Right. And, um, but I'm like, maybe I'm fucking crazy. I don't know. But like, I'm not going to get pissed off. What is that going to do? No, no I'm going to get my jack out. I'm going to jack this thing up. For whatever reason, this is happening just as it's supposed to, you know. And so 
Um, that's one thing that helps for me, and you cannot help it. I think it's scientifically proven. With a smile on your face or in a state of gratitude, you cannot feel any other emotion. Exactly. I've tried it. <laughs> yeah. No doubt. At least for me, I can't anyway. Yeah, exactly. Coming out of that that slump, that life slump, whatever you want to call it, and, and doing what you're doing now, you're doing a lot of cool things. What is it that scares you? What fears do you have today? I don't necessarily have any fears, to be real honest with you. I mean, I couldn't even really vocalize any kind of fear I have, you know, I mean, I guess it, I guess the only thing that maybe would lean towards a fear would be leaving this earth without leaving a good name. But that doesn't even scare me because I, I know that and I, I try to do the right thing at, at every turn of the corner, you know, I mean, I guess it's, so, you know, so really, I don't really have any fears. That's a cool answer. I don't necessarily worry about it because like you said earlier, there's nothing you can change. Mm -hmm. My life has been written in the stars. The moment I was born, my life was written in the stars. Yeah. And I truly believe that, you know, there's things that happened throughout my life that have made me where, who I am and what I am today. And there's gonna be things that happen in the future that I can't control that are gonna make me who I am and what I am in the future. So, I mean, I don't, you can't control that. You can't control, you know, going down the road and a wheel coming off your trailer or a wheel coming off somebody's trailer and coming across the road and it hitting you, you know, I mean, those people might pull over and there might be some reason that that happened. You know, they might pull over and you might meet somebody that changes your life, you know, I mean, we talked about it a little bit last night. I mean, when Bert came to work for me, my partner in Boston Union, I didn't know that guy. Didn't ever expect to meet a guy like him, you know, mm -hmm. especially in a situation that I met him in and get to spend some time with him. But that guy changed my life just as well as he'll tell you that I changed his life and possibly even saved his life. You know, I mean, it, so it's a it's a crazy world we live in. And, you know, I mean, it happens for a reason. St everything happens for a reason. And I truly believe that when the day you're born is written in the stars of how you're gonna die, you know, I mean, and your life in between those two points. Mm -hmm. And so I don't I don't necessarily worry about it. I mean, if, when it's my time, it's my time. A lot of people are scared to death, you know, or scared to do something. I, I mean, it's my time, it's my time. Whether, you know, a lightning bolt comes out of the sky and slaps me in the ear off a horse one day, like it could have this morning, you know, I mean, people are kind of leery about that. Oh, I don't wanna ride. Well, look, I promise you, when it's your time, if a bolt falls out of a jet running across the country and it hits you in the top of the head and kills you, it's your time. That's it. You know, so you can't you can't control that. And That's right. I, there's no sense in worrying about it. I don't try to. I try to keep all my. I'm not smart enough to keep everything in my mind, anyways, and much less clutter it up with stuff you can't control. You're living the Western lifestyle. You're ranching full time you know that's what you're supposed to be doing. Right. Some people never find that, right. you know? And for me, I was searching, like, what is my purpose in this world? So how did you know that ranching was the path that's that you were supposed to be going? To go. the, uh, I did a lot of different things, you know, when I graduated high school, I went to college a little bit here and there, and um, I got in with an outfitter and hunted for three or four or five years. And then I went to work for Lone Star Gas as a construction guy. My dad welded, and so I welded some, built some fence, different things. I was a lineman. And that's the reason I actually came to Fort Worth, because I hired on a TXU Electric as a lineman. I grew up around cattle a little bit. My granddad had a small farm, ranch, whatever you want to call it. I didn't grow up in a big ranch country. I didn't grow up as a cowboy, you know what I mean? I grew up as a on the western side of it. I guess, I yeah, I was a cowboy, horse guy, whatever you want to call it, but I didn't, but I tried everything else. Played sports, you know, getting in high school and junior high, played sports and kind of, that took the place of being a cowboy for five or six years. And then I graduated high school and lost the sports. And then I started searching for where I was, what I was supposed to be, who I was, you know, at that time that when you're 20 years old, you're trying to figure out who you are and create your identity. Well, so I did a few different things and I loved the hunting, guiding deal. And I didn't necessarily like working for Lone Star Gas, but it supplemented my income, you know, so I could survive. And then I hired on a TU and came up here, moved to Fort Worth and was a lineman. And, you know, did a little bit of everything, but I never was really happy. And I think that's where my drinking really started because I was trying to cover up that unhappiness with something that dulled the, who am I? You know, I didn't know who I was. And so 
I kind of replaced who I was with the drinking deal. And I, you know, it just gradually got worse and worse and more and more and more until the fact of the point of the matter, we talked about it last night, I was laying in a jail, laying on a bunk one night and going, man, what in the hell, where did, where did I, where did I go wrong? You know, how did, how am I ended up here? Mm-hmm. And, uh, I did a lot, I did a pretty good soul searching that night and it really came to a conclusion that the only reason I was where I was at was because of what I did, not anybody else's fault. Yeah. And I took that accountability on myself and was like, you know what, I'm, I'm better than this. My family raised me better than this. I know better than this. And so I'm not going to blame anybody except myself for where I'm at. Nobody helped me here. Nobody caused me to be here. Everything that I chose was of my choosing. And uh, so I made a promise to myself that night that I would never be back in that situation. And the only reason I was in that situation was because of my drinking. And so I promised myself I would never touch it again. And I haven't for 17 years. And it actually created, created probably the best thing for me was because I had to figure out how to make myself happy. And it actually rolled right back into the cowboy kind of lifestyle. This is what I want to do. And once I kind of got back into that, I realized it. And I was like, yeah, here's where I need to be. This makes me happy. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. And so I just, like I say, I go back to being buster and I go 120%. I just dove into it head first and went to trying to ride a few horses and begging and borrowing and, you know, I'd begged around, finally saved enough money, got a couple horses bought and started starting horses and started hanging around guys that were in that atmosphere and that, and that job. And, you know, it's like another saying that I say a lot is you're the average of the five people you hang around the most. Yeah. Well, you want to hang around a bunch of drug addicts, you're going to be the average drug addict. If you want to hang around a bunch of millionaires, you're going to be an average millionaire. I mean, you're the average of the five people you hang around the most. So I went to immersing myself in that culture and trying to figure out and learn it as best I could, as fast as I could, and add to my repertoire, I guess, of what I am. Mm-hmm. And I figured that out that, hey, I'm pretty good at this. And so that even drove me harder and faster. You know, I want to, I want to just, I just got it all like here, give it to me. Let's see what I can retain. And it's, you know, it's created who I am today. And it's been a blessing. You know, I've had a lot of people help me along the way. I didn't get there by myself by any means, you know, and whether I'm anywhere at all, but I didn't get to where I am today because of just Buster. I mean, it took a lot of people to help me along the way and, those people are still very, very, I guess, mentors to me, you know, I mean, that I cherish and love dearly. And we still talk today, you know, I mean, there's a, there's guys out there that, that helped me along the way. I mean, that, that gave me, Hey, they gave me a, they gave me a little bit, you know, they didn't give it all to me, but they gave me a little bit. They gave me a little bit of information or they gave me a job for a few weeks or they gave me a horse to ride or they gave me, you know, a, something to think about or they gave me a you know a rope or there's always something somebody gives you to create you yeah and if you don't whether you're aware that, enough to see right, it if you don't have that gratitude that's it. towards that and then then you're not aware enough to see it and i was very gracious to people that helped me because they didn't have to mm-hmm. and so today i try to do that as well if somebody calls me and asks me about this or you know i see somebody comes a young kid or somebody comes and helps me or i'm around them i try to give them a little bit of the knowledge that has been passed down to me and you know i mean it's just like like i said if you want to be something then go find the best at that and go hang out with them because they're generally going to help you <laughs> because they want somebody to take their spot sooner or later somebody's going to have to take their spot and and, and whether you want to be the best baseball player, go hang out with the best ball, baseball players you can find. You want to be the best bronc rider, go hang out with the best bronc riders you can find. I mean, whatever it is, you want to be the best businessman, go hang out with the best businessman you can find. Mm-hmm. And that'll lead you to where you want to be. That's it. Eventually. Yeah. If you have the will and the drive and the fortitude to get there and to put the work in. And that's it, and that's the best investment one can take is invest your time with those people that have been there. No doubt. You know? And be gracious for their help because they don't have to help you. That's right. 
And when you find those people that are willing to help you, you better hang on to it because they're few and far between in this world today because everybody's out for their self and they could give a damn whether I made it. As long as they make it, they could give a damn whether I made it, you know. But there are people out there that do give a damn and they want to help you and they'll pull you out and say, come go with me, let me show you how to do this. Yeah. And I'm going to give you some knowledge that not everybody knows and I had to uh, gain this knowledge through experience mm -hmm. and I'm going to just shorten and let you have it because you want it. That's it. And that's another thing too. I've worked some kids here at the ranch that you can tell whether they really want it or not, you know, pretty quick. Mm -hmm. And a good friend of mine now, he's like my little brother. He came here and I wanted to see how bad he wanted it. How bad you really want something. It means a lot to somebody that's giving you something. And you might not think it at the time that they're giving you something, but they are giving you something. Yeah. And whether it's a paycheck or whether it's knowledge or whether it's, you know, just like I said, people gave me stuff. And uh, it's one of those deals where those that don't really, really want it, I don't have a whole lot of time for them. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not going to waste my time and what I had to go through, you know, to help somebody that's not going to use it. The one thing I didn't hear you mention at all during that whole thing was, you know, you talked about you found what you love to do and, and that you're passionate about and you're happy. But you never mentioned money. <laughs> no. Can you tell me what money means to you? Man, money is, you know, you got to have it. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to sit around and tell you you don't have to have money. You got to have money to pay your bills and buy your essentials and do all that stuff. But, I, you know, I mean, you can't take it with you when you're gone. I mean, that's just it. So, yeah, it's nice and it's good to have enough money that you're comfortable, in my opinion. No doubt about it, but I don't need a 7,000 square foot house. I don't need five or six cars because I, I mean, I don't like cleaning as it is. And so I don't want a big house. I got to clean. And, it, and in my opinion, money just creates more problems. And, uh, you know, I'm kind of simple. I, I, I like to hunt. I like to fish. I like to, you know, be cowboy. And I like to go hang out and do this. But I don't necessarily. Money is not something that I just desire. Yeah, like I say, I think you got to have money. But there's, you can't take it with you when you're gone. Yeah. And so, I mean, you can pile it up to the sky if you're not doing what you want to do and you're not helping somebody. Yeah. And what difference does it make how much damn money you got? Yeah. I mean, yeah, pile it up and stay over there in, in your little world yeah. and you don't get to do anything because you got all this money and it's, you know, all it does is attract problems. Yeah, I talked about it yesterday um, in an interview that we had. I mean, money, it really just magnifies who you are as a person. You bet. If you're a shitty person, it's going to magnify you that. You bet, no doubt. you're a good person, you're doing good things, you get to do more good things. It's an evil deal and it's a good deal. I mean, like you yeah. say, it's kind of like that old Indian story. You got two wolves inside of you. One's, one's bad and one's good. And he said, they're always fighting. The grandson says, which one wins? And he says, the one you feed the most. So, I mean, I've always, I've read that, you know, way back and it's true, you know, I mean, it is very, very true. It's whatever you feed the most wins. And in the cowboy world, you don't make no money anyways. <laughs> you do, the, you do cowboys, it because you love it, right? You do it because you love it. You love the lifestyle, you love it, you know, I mean, if somebody says, we're not going to pay you for anything, I'll be like, well, that'd be all right. I still keep doing what I'm doing, you know, something will work out that I can you know, I mean, hell, I feed myself and, yeah. you know, clothe myself and house myself somehow or another. I'll figure it out. But that's what I'm going to do, you know, is be a cowboy. I really realized that. I always kind of knew that. But I really realized that when I watched an interview with Boots O'Neill. Yeah. And he talked about when he would go to bed at night, he would just be so excited that he gets to go right. do what he loves tomorrow, you know. And then I think he even went on to say, like, he had a vacation. Finally took a vacation. And he went and worked cows somewhere down in Arizona yeah. or somewhere, you know. Yeah. So when yeah. you're taking a vacation to go do the same job you have, yeah. you're, you you found your purpose. You bet. You know, and I've done the same thing. Somebody said, hey, can you come help us brand? And I'm like, man, no, no we're like, but yeah, you know what? I'm going to take a week's worth of vacation and go help somebody. <laughs> yeah. Go help them brand because it's it's fun. That's what I love doing. You know, I enjoy doing that. It's, you know, there's times that it sucks. No doubt about it. I mean, there, there's times that it's, it's hard and that it sucks and you don't want to. You don't want to have to do it, but it's just part of it and you do it. But there's the majority of the time, it's always, I mean, if that's what you love to do, it's fun. Like it's, 
hey, can you take off and come and go with me and kiss some cows? Oh, hell yeah, you know, that's fun. You know, <laughs> heck yeah, that's a lot funner than going to build a fence. You know? <laughs> yeah, but, I was about to say Yeah, that. heck yeah, you know, I'd take vacation to go catch cows with a guy, a buddy of mine, you know, or go ship yearlings or go brand his calves, you know. So, yeah, it's fun. That's that's what crazy part of the cowboy is, is you take off to go cowboy. If you're taking vacation to do what you do every day, but you're just going to go somewhere else, yeah, it's part of your life, and that's part of what you're supposed to do. Yeah. That's it. For man. sure. That's it. Let's move into some of the stuff you got going on now. You know, you got a, a very good Instagram following. Um, you've got some stuff going on with Bison Union Meat Company. Can you yeah. talk a little bit about some of that stuff? Yeah, I uh, I got lucky enough to meet Bert Kuntz, who is uh, my partner. Well, he's the he's the big part of the partnership, but I've got a small part of Bison Union, and uh, Bison Union is a Americana t-shirt kind of lifestyle brand that we also we sell coffee now is we have bison union coffee we have a set of a herd of buffalo in sheridan wyoming our headquarters where bird lives is in sheridan wyoming we have a coffee shop um i was very fortunate enough to meet bird bird is a uh, spec ops guy retired out of the military did 15 years in the military as spec ops and uh an individual that there's a reason they call them special operations because those people that do that are very special along with anybody that serves in the military or first responders i mean that those people give up something to protect you and i that i can't i can't even fathom you know i mean because i've never been in the military and i can't fathom what they give up because i i know it's a great deal that they give up to do and protect and be who they are for me as a civilian, you as a civilian, you know, to get to live the life that I get to live and love. The only reason I get to do that is because of those people. So right. my hat's off to them. Great, great, great deal of gratitude to those people and their families. You know. But back to Bert, I met Bert. He had just retired out of the military army and uh, was living in Fort Worth. Met a mutual friend of mine and he was, Bert was needing something to do to keep his mind and his body active. And so for some reason or another, he hit this buddy of mine up and said, hey, you know anybody that ranches around here I that would let me come work for him? And our mutual friend said, yeah, I know one guy, let me call him. And so he called me and he kind of gave me the lowdown on Bert and told me what he was, gave me a little background on him. And I was like, I, it intrigued me because I'd never been around those guys. I'm like, yeah, send him over. I want to see, you know, yeah, I want to meet him. And so Bert came over. I'll never forget. It was kind of a rainy day like today. And he drove up and he got out of his pickup and he come up to the door and I met him out on the porch and he handed me a piece of a plastic with some paper in it. And I kind of look at it. Well, it's his resume. And I'm, I look at it for just a second, and kind of turn it over and look at it. And I hand it back to him. I said, man, if you got a resume, you're way too qualified to come work for me. <laughs> and he kind of thought that was funny, you know, and say, so I hand it back to him and we visit for just a minute and and I'm like, yeah, I'll work you, you know, I mean, I, it's just work. I mean, that's all there is to it. It's, I'll pay you 10 bucks an hour and you can work 20 hours a week or you can work 80 hours a week. I don't care. There's always something to be done, you know. Mm -hmm. And so we hit it off and uh, he come to work for me and pretty quick I figured out that guy's, I mean, he's pretty special. I mean, he's the, just mentally pretty special hands eye coordination i mean those guys are very well trained and they are they're core of the earth good people mm -hmm. and uh, have been done a lot and so anyways about two weeks in I f we're kind of we're figuring each other out you know and about a month in we're pretty damn close friends and then about two months in we're like brothers you know and something like it's uh it was just a chance meeting by, you know, and then about six or eight months into the deal, and he comes out one day, we're, we're talking, and he's like, hey, I got an idea about starting a company, and I want to know if you'd help me, and I'm like, yeah, I'll help you do whatever, you know, and so he kind of throws the idea about Bison Union, and we started with making one t-shirt, and then we sold it, and made two t-shirts, and we sold them, and it's just kind of snowballed into what it is today, and uh <laughs> It, it changed my life, and he'll straight up tell you it changed his life and possibly even saved his life, you know I mean? It, but it did, it changed my life. I got to meeting people through Bert 
bird met people through me and everything kind of just worked out the way it's supposed to work like i said it's in the stars yeah. whether or not you believe that or not i mean it was written in the stars that i was supposed to meet bert you know and so yeah we started a company bison union and then that's kind of rolled into some other stuff we we sell coffee and we sell t-shirts and ball caps and like i say a little bit of everything coffee mugs and bert's also bought some a buffalo herd so we own a few buffalo he runs all that stuff. We've got a coffee shop at Sheridan, Wyoming, and that has led into, you know, the, I guess the backstory on the Instagram deal is like, I didn't have Instagram five, six years ago, and Bert did, and I didn't even know what the hell Instagram was. And uh, he kept telling me, you need to get Instagram, you need to get Instagram. I'm like, I don't need that junk, man. I don't need, what the hell I need Instagram for? He's like, you need to get it, you need to get it. So once we started the business, he kind of convinced me that I needed to get it because of it would help the business. And I was like, all right, cool. So I handed him my phone one day as we're driving down the road, and I'm like, put Instagram on there. And so he did, and it kind of opened my eyes, you know. I mean, I was like, got to seeing people from all over the world and different things, and people got to seeing me. And like Bird said, when he came here, he's like, man, I didn't even know people like you existed anymore. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, yeah, there's a bunch of us, to be real honest with you, you know. I mean, there's a lot of us that exist. And he's like, people need to see that because people don't understand that you guys do what you do and feed the the world. And he's like, they don't understand where their meat comes from. They don't understand where their grain comes from. They don't understand where their milk comes from. You know, a lot of people don't have the privilege of knowing somebody that does what you do. Yeah. And so I'm like, all right, cool, you know, whatever. And my Instagram following kind of started because of Bert. And he was, you know, sending people, hey, follow this guy, you know. And so it's kind of now I think I've got 27 or 8,000 people that follow me, you know, which is nothing. But in the cowboy world, it's that's a lot of people. I mean, Yeah, you're touching a lot of people, yeah, though, so you know, in a positive a, way. No doubt. And then it's also touched me back, you know. I mean, I meet people that I would have never, ever met any other way other than on Instagram, you know. And, and those people, it's like you say, it's just a big circle and you get to touch people that you normally wouldn't do and yeah. you know I can help somebody and they can help me and I help this person and they help this person and then that person helps you know it just ties everything together yeah and again you can do it the platform can be good or it can be for no good you know I mean however you want to put it yeah it's whatever you feed the most kind of like the two wolves fighting inside of you you know if you feed it for a good side it's good and if you use it to be fake and show what you don't have or what you think you know your persona and your ego and you do all that i mean I, I don't know i mean i try to help people with mine and i try to be real and i try to be buster and i don't know how to really be anybody else so i'm just buster yeah and uh you know you can take it or you can leave it it's that's cool i mean that's fine i mean you don't nobody everybody doesn't have to like me and everybody doesn't you know i mean so that's that's fine with me i'm good with that but i do understand that i can help people with touching them and showing them you know and seeing that hey there are guys and also help my industry as well that hey there are guys like us that are out there that punch cows for a living that you don't see that you don't see on the news that that do do good that feed your family their family and hundreds of thousands of other families yeah. because we bust our ass and do it for a little bit of nothing yeah because it's the life we love and that's the life we want to live and we're not going to ask you for any handouts. We're not going to ask you for anything. We'll tend to it and we will give you our product, you know, at the cheapest rate we can possibly give it to you because this is the lifestyle we love. And a lot of people don't understand that, you know, I mean, that they, they just don't have any idea. Yeah. And so it has helped maybe spread the word about cowboys, ranchers, agriculture, farmers, whatever it may be, you know, I mean, it's in our, in our little niche mm -hmm. i guess so um that that has led into i've partnered with some guys in a meat company it's called range hand meat co and it's a uh, we do some restaurant delivery stuff and we also do home delivery so if you want to order beef you know from us any kind of well, actually meat i mean not necessarily just beef but we have some sausages and mainly beef, but we do have some chicken and different things like that. So home delivery service, which, you know, I think's become pretty big, especially since the COVID deal started. And people don't want to get out and then people hoarded, you know, they go in and buy 20 pounds of hamburger meat and somebody else doesn't get it, you know? And so people have kind of gone like to the, 
small batch people where they can actually get what they need from them, you know, kind of the small businesses and the homegrown stuff. And so I think the world's changing and maybe for the better on that side of it, slowed everybody down where they do kind of think about where their stuff, where their food comes from. Instead of just going to Walmart or going to H. It's not just made at the grocery store. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I mean, I think it's good for our side of the business. We're going to finally kind of attain some business from people slowing down and going, you know what, maybe I do need to figure out, you know, maybe I can go to my local rancher or local farm and buy the product that, yeah. and know where it came from as opposed to go to Walmart and not know whether that meat came from Namibia or whether it came from Australia or whether it came from Texas, you know, you don't know. Yeah. So that's kind of what I got going on now. Well, man, it's been great. I could probably sit here and talk to you for another two or three hours. Um, but I, I'm very grateful for your time, you know, last night for dinner and then today and, 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 you know, just riding through the pasture and then sitting down with you today to answer some questions. I'm very grateful for your time because I think that is the most valuable asset we have. And so for you to share that with us, I'm, uh, like I said, I'm just very grateful. So I look forward to seeing what, what uh, is to come in Buster Frierson's future. Um, you're doing, like I said, a lot of good things. So... Um, I look forward to the things to come. So thank you again. No, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity that you've given me to be on your podcast and get to visit with you in the last couple of days, you know, and just hanging out and getting to make a new friend. And uh, yeah, hopefully it'll lead to something in the future. And, yeah. and uh, you know, I appreciate you doing what you do, you know, getting going around and talking to some guys that I respect and are my heroes, you know. I mean, the guys you've been talking to are, people that I really respect and I, I just, I'm, I'm honored to get to be included and in just getting to talk to you. So I appreciate you and doing what you do. Yep, you bet. I enjoyed it very much. Yes, sir, you bet. Buster and I share many of the same beliefs and have a very similar outlook on life. He is a blend of old school cowboy with a progressive mindset that allows for optimal personal growth. With hands the size of a catcher's mitt, Buster can be an intimidating fellow, but he is genuinely one of the most authentic and humble people that I've ever met. I'm glad to have crossed paths with him and I look forward to seeing where Buster's journey takes him in the future. Until next time, stay grateful and be kind.